a Living History production. I'm Matt McLaughlin. And I'm Pete Smith. We're battlefield historians who love nothing better than getting out and walking the ground where great battles in history took place. And now we'd like you to come with us. Every week, Battle Walks will take you to one of the great battlefields of Europe. As we walk the ground, we'll dig through the pages of history, we'll uncover the secrets of the battlefields, and most importantly, we'll tell the stories of the people who fought and died there. Welcome to Battle Walks. Hello and welcome to Battle Walks as we stroll across the great battlefields of Europe. I'm Matt McLaughlin and joining me once again is a dear friend and a great historian. It's Pete Smith. Pete, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Matt. Great to be here again. Today, mate, we are heading back to the Somme, a place we've touched on a couple of times in the podcast so far. But this is really your stomping ground, isn't it? We're going to the village of Fleur, a place that you know very, very well. Tell us all about the walk that we're going to do today. Well, it's where I live, so it's a, it's a walk I do on a regular basis. Um, what I thought we'd do is basically start at one end of the village and walk to the other end. We're not going to particularly concentrate on the fighting in 1916 or the fighting in 1918. We're going to do a general overview of what happened to the village at the various uh, uh, phases of, uh, of the Great War. Um, we're going to start at a place called, now you'll have to excuse my French here, a Rideau de Filois. I think that's how you pronounce it, which is basically about uh, half a kilometre outside of the village and it's on the right-hand side and the village is in front of it. We're looking towards the village. We have uh, Delville Wood behind us, very famous for the South Africans. This windy little road, uh, quite open, no woods on the road and we're going to start with this li- where this little mound is on the right-hand side and then walk through the village. What I love about this, Pete, and it's what I'm really enjoying about battle walks that we've been doing so far, is this is not a walk along the front line for the first day of the Somme or the Battle of Pozier for the Australians or Villers Bretno. This is a lesser known but still very important site on the battlefields. And it's a site that I think people, when they're touring the battlefields, might not necessarily spend a lot of time in. And I think it's wonderful that we have this opportunity to dig deeply into this history, to tell some stories, perhaps some unknown chapters of the First World War history. It's a very important little location for for one major, I suppose, uh, uh, fact, and that is this is where tanks were very first used. In fact, the village of Flair was the first village to be captured by tanks. So for those that are interested in the tank corps and the uh, heavy branch machine gun corps, as it was called at that time, then this is a must come and, uh, and have a look at. But for a lot of others, it is a, a byline, a, a sideshow of the of the front line. And in fact, uh, the fighting here on the 15th of September 1916, when it was taken, was fairly tough, but, but using these tanks. Uh, and then it's more a case of holding the line for that terrible winter of 1916-17. So we'll be discussing that, that horrible winter of 16-17, coldest for 40 years. So not a pleasant place, place to be. And once again, the village of Fleur really sums up Firstly, it, it, it demonstrates the length of the First World War, the, the static nature that the, the war did not move particularly far in terms of geographic terms over a very long period of time, but also the collaborative effort from the Allies because there are fascinating stories in and around this village to do with British troops, New Zealanders, South Africans, Australians because of that terrible winter you discussed. It, it, to me, it's a, it's, it's a beautiful little encapsulation of just these, these myriad of convoluted stories that, that really define the First World War. Correct. And the the first one that we're going to start with is actually the story of the French, because in 1914, this is where the story starts of the fighting around our village. It's uh, been held by the French. And on the 26th of September 1914, the the Germans arrive uh, in their their rush to the coast. And uh, there is fighting through the village. It's fighting that's light from the point of view of what's going to come later on. So houses would be windows smashed, some damaged, some roofs taken off. But effectively, the village is still there. It's overrun by the Germans on that date, the 26th of September. It's uh, it's not held. Um, in fact, it's a French territorial part-time soldiers who are trying to, to hold the village, the 82nd Territorial Division of the French Army. Um, unsuccessful. And one of the things we're going to pass on the walk is a memorial to them. There is a memorial to the French fighting here in 1940. Team, but sadly, it's unsuccessful fighting. The Germans uh, carry on on their rush towards the uh, the coast and eventually being stopped uh, close to uh, to uh, Amiens. In fact, just uh, Amiens itself was was captured at that time. Um, 
But it's the village is intact, and the village is actually then going to be used by the Germans as a rear area. So they're going to use it for training troops. The, the church is converted into a field hospital. So it's very much something you know, that's going to be incorporated into the uh, the German positions. Hence, the villages are, are removed. Those that didn't leave when the Germans arrived are going to be removed by the Germans and taken to uh, to camps in Belgium, uh, where there'll be uh, refugees, effectively. And what was the story of Fleur in uh, in later parts of the war? So obviously during the later stages of the Battle of the Somme, Fleur was uh, was pivotal as the, the scene of the first use of tanks. And when we say the first use of tanks, we don't just mean in the First World War or on the Western Front. We mean in history. This was the first time that the very new invention, the tank, was used in combat. So quite an extraordinary uh, connection with history there in the village of Fleur. But tell us a bit more about what the village was involved in uh, into 1916, 1917, and indeed 1918, and then we'll take a stroll through the town. Okay, well, in 1916, then obviously this is where the tanks are used. And in fact, it's it's famous mainly because of a a, a newspaper article and a, and a telegram actually that went out around the world and was used by the press. And in the, the headline was, a tank is walking up the high street of Flares with the British Army cheering behind. And it's a bit of an exaggeration, to put it mildly. Um, the uh, the tank is obviously isn't walking, but nobody really knew how tanks moved. Uh, obviously, the people involved and the infantry who'd been briefed and had sometimes trained very, not a great deal, you have to say at this point, to work with tanks, but they, they weren't sure, so they decided to use the term walking. Um, and uh, yes, the infantry cheering on behind it. Yes, uh, again, probably a, a minor exaggeration. But uh, nevertheless, it was successful. A tank did walk up the main uh, the main street of Flares on the 15th of September 1916, so it's a, it's a famous uh, uh, day. The village is then going to be just behind the front line for that terrible winter of 1617. And then the Germans will withdraw back to the Hindenburg line. So this becomes then 10, uh, 12 kilometres or more behind the line. So it's a, a realigned village again. Not that there's much left of it. The village itself had been almost swept away by, we have to say, by our artillery fire prior to the attack on the 15th of September 1916. So very much flattened, not a great deal left. In fact, one of the uh, official artists, British official artists, drew some sketches around here so you can uh, have a look at those i'm sorry i can't actually remember what he's called it's, it doesn't matter really but it's um yeah it's a, so it's it's a safe place to be and then again sadly in 1918 the germans are going to be back in their spring offensive they're going to overrun this this area again some quite heavy fighting and that will basically see the the absolute ruination of anything that was left there will be nothing left here whatsoever so and finally the village will be damaged yet again in that final push in the hundred days as we uh, overrun the German positions and force them back towards the end of end of the war. So at that point there is nothing left. We have, are left with nothing. And I'm going to describe the village in more detail as we walk into it. Pete, isn't it extraordinary that as I touched on before, I think Fleur is a place that many people would never have heard of. Perhaps only if they're interested in the tank warfare or if they are interested in that bitter winter of 1916, 1917, they may, they may have heard of Fleur. But for most people, this is not a village that would spring to mind. And yet, what a rich history. It just shows that every facet of the First World War involved a, a myriad of stories and history, didn't it? Oh, it, 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 indeed so. Uh, and this village, uh, perhaps more so because of that use of tanks than many villages in this area. And of course, like all of the villages in this area, it is going to be flattened and, and swept away entirely. And it's actually something that's very hard, even though I've lived here now for nearly 20 years, to to envisage a village that had, had gone in its entirety. Even the bricks had been reused. The bricks left from the uh, the remains of the houses were going to be used for the roadworks. The timber had been used for revetting or just for firewood. So there literally was nothing here. This was a village that, that had ceased to exist, exist totally. And it's, it's just really hard to get your head around it. When you walk up and down through these streets, because it was rebuilt exactly as it had been, and some of it not, not so well built, so it looks, looks like it's been here for hundreds of years, but it hasn't. It's been here for a hundred years or less, because most of it wasn't completed, the rebuilding, till 1927. That's the date that's emblazoned on the front of my property, 1927. I think it's great that you mentioned the total destruction of the village, Pete, because we've had a couple of requests through social media for us to talk about the Zone Rouge the red zone that describes this area of the Western Front that was completely destroyed during the war and had to be rebuilt from scratch. And Fleur obviously fits fairly squarely in the middle of that zone, doesn't it? It does indeed. And the uh, Zone Rouge is a, an interesting concept. It's a, a French concept uh, which had, had been discussed. And really it was an idea to preserve, not in that sense of preserving it as a battlefield, just to preserve the landscape uh, that had been fought over heavily. 
And there are multiple reasons, but you have to say the most important one was the danger to human life and people coming back, mainly from the explosives that were everywhere, live shells, live rounds, grenades, everything. And they still are. I mean, they're still being ploughed up to this day uh, all over this landscape. But there was also a worry, a worry that we we can perceive connected with uh, nuclear and biological and chemical warfare. But at that time, nobody really knew what gas was going to do long term. But there'd been massive amounts of gas used on the whole length of the First World War. So there was a worry. What is it going to be like for people if they move back into these areas? Will they be able to live there? Should this landscape be left as as it is? And certainly, if you go into the big French sectors around Verdun, there are great tracts of land that have been left exactly as they were. Here, that's not going to happen. And it's partly a mistake, really, for the, the, the British, which are we are in charge of this area. For British, I mean the Empire forces, we are in charge of this area here. And... Uh, We didn't stop the farmers from coming back. And effectively, as in the 100 days in 1918, as we force the Germans back, then the civilian population comes in behind us and they start to fill in the shell holes and level the landscape and try to to put temporary accommodation up. And it was felt, once once this had happened, it was felt that for, even for the French government of the time, it would be political suicide to now try and push these farmers back off and say, no, 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 we're not having this land. This land is being preserved as it is. It's seen as too dangerous. It's seen as an area that should be kept um, partly as a memorial to all of those that were lost here. So uh, Zone Rouge does not exist in this area. There's an interesting aspect of that. Have there been soil tests done in the areas where it has been left? And yes, there have. Uh, is the soil contaminated? Yes, it is. It's very much contaminated by heavy metals, the lead in the ball bearings from the shrapnel shells, and also from the explosives. You're, you're getting uh, residues left in the in the ground that are difficult for us to uh, to to. Uh, well, it would affect us. It would affect us in our food. So you have to say here, is there, is there an issue here? Well, well, I'd have to say, yes, there probably is. Have there been many tests of the landscape here? I'm not sure. I think if they did, they would find that there was a problem. But certainly potatoes and uh, and other vegetables and animal food is, is grown here and there doesn't appear to be any issue connected with it. But it does make you wonder when you're looking at the landscape and realising it is the same as the, the landscape around Verdun. Well, it's a fascinating place, Pete. So let's jump in. Let's do a walk through your village of Fleur. Where are we going to begin? Well, we're going to start at this place. You're going to make me say it again now, aren't you? The Rideau de Filois. <laughs> the Rideau de Filois, we're going to start alongside here. And it's an interesting little location, mainly because it was photographed to such an extent, because one of the very first tanks that walked, this one that walked up the high street of, of Fleur, will turn round and come back with its engine knocking like mad. There was obviously something very wrong with the engine. Uh, and the commander decided, uh, Lieutenant uh, Stuart Hasty, decided that he needed to get out of the village before it broke down completely. And this is where he got to. He basically pulled in here before the thing completely seized up. And uh, and this is where it remained for the next, well, I don't know exactly how long, but certainly a few, uh, few days, um, possibly longer. And it was used as a brigade HQ by many of the units operating in the area in that the start of that winter until it was repaired and then eventually left the area. And it was well photographed. So I always uh, like to start my walks as we walk through the village here because it's just a, a place that is, is quite uh, well known to those that like photographs of the that first day of the use of tanks. Um, from here we're going to walk towards the village and the next thing that we're going to come across is this memorial I've already mentioned the French memorial it's on the right hand side just beyond the sign that says flare or flares Uh, and uh, it's a a fairly big obelisk in uh, granite and it's commemorating the 82nd uh, territorial division a much under underviewed, underutilised, undermentioned, uh, because uh, as we've been discussing, not that many people come to Flair. And if you do come to Flair, then obviously you're interested mainly in the Empire and the British experience. We don't think about the French in 1914 a great deal. And so it's it's not really commented upon and it needs to be because there are not, there are very few memorials to the French in this area in 1914. So in fact, I can't think of another one that, uh, within striking distance. So it's a, it's a, a, a well worth having a look at that. It's one of the great injustices of the First World War, Pete, that we don't mention the French enough. We, we don't account for their contribution nearly enough. Even, even when I was describing the nationalities that fought in the village of Fleur, even I didn't mention the French then. So it's, it's a very Anglo-American way of looking at the First World War, is to overlook the contribution of the French. And perhaps it's to do with what happened in the Second World War. And again, our somewhat distorted view of the cheese-eating surrender monkeys, as the Simpsons called them. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the French have been tarred by this impression of what went on in the Second World War, and I think that permeates into the First World War as well. But it's completely unfair. The French 
were not only a vital component of the fighting on the Western Front in the First World War, they carried the bulk of the load through large sections of the war. So I think it's fantastic that at this spot, when we stop here, we think not just about the French who fought in this village, but the French in general and their massive contribution to victory on the Western Front. I agree entirely, and I have to say that uh, yeah, we're we're terrible at it uh, when I when I say we. I'm really talking about the British because our favourite day of the first of our commemorative day, really, that we we remember more than any other, the first of July, the terrible casualties, sixty thousand casualties. We don't even kind of even give a thought to the fact that the French were attacking on that same day. So uh, in support, uh, uh, alongside us, it, hand in hand. In fact, there's a memorial just up the street from where I where I am now in Flair, commemorating that hand in hand attack on the first of July in 1916. We don't mention it. We do not, don't even think about it. When we're thinking of the 1st of July, we're thinking of the terrible, terrible British losses on that first day. So yeah, so it's well worth uh, remembering that they, they are here and fighting very hard, both in 1914 and in 1916. And it, it wasn't something that it wasn't something that the um, that the veterans themselves felt. The veterans always felt it was a very united British French operation. The, the whole war was, and that's why we see it. Tiepval, for example the main memorial to the British missing on the Western Front, or in France at least, there is uh, there is a, a joint French-Anglo cemetery beside the memorial to demonstrate that, 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 that contribution. So again, I think it's important that we remember the French. There's a whole story connected with that uh, cemetery there, which we'll do on another podcast when we cover the uh, the Tietval Memorial. So back on to, to the village and onwards walking in, and we cross over a sunken, a little sunken lane. So there's a lane running left and right, both sunken. These lanes that are basically uh, uh, kind of sunken into the ground. There's no other way of saying it, really. And uh, here, it's very famous um, for those that are interested in the village, is a battery of howitzers came galloping along this road that we are walking along, swung to the right into the sunken lane, unhitched their horses. The horses galloped back, those that remained, because quite a few had been killed on the on the way in. And uh, 4.5-inch howitzers got into action very quickly in support of the infantry who are fighting on the far side of the village. So I always like to remember the, the artillery here. Very often when we're talking about the, the fighting of the First World War, we're thinking of the infantry, the man carrying his rifle and bayonet. And we don't very often stop to think about the artillery, who very often are in in very close support to uh, the infantry uh, assaults. Onwards again uh, into the village. A bit, little bit of uh, information. Population 250 or thereabouts at the moment, um, of which my family is part of that 250. Uh, I suspect that prior to, in fact, I know that prior to the Great War, the population had been considerably higher than that, and it will be in the real bit rebuilding phase in the 30s. But uh, after that, as the mechanisation of farming I- increases and... Uh, People left, people uh, also transport, public transport here is not brilliant, and I have to say, so people have slowly been leaving until just recently, and there is now a turnaround, and we're getting more people moving into the village, and the village is certainly on the up. A lot of the older properties being renovated, so yeah, so it's it's nice to uh, to, to watch that, watch the increase and the, the, the village actually getting more life into it. So we then walk into the village, the true village itself, passing by my house, which is on the left-hand side, and in fact was a fortification for the Germans in 1916 during that 15th of September, and it was a strong point, and in fact a tank was dispatched to take out the strong point. So it's uh, nothing left, there's not not, a, not an article left, not a bunker, nothing to see, but uh, I know that my house or the remnants of my house uh, were, were was being used as a strong point at that time. Then we walk uh, a little zigzag in the village. It's the only kink in the in the road, and it was there in 1914, and it was put back. They didn't straight, straighten the road out. They put everything back as it was. And into the heart of the village, and we're going to come to the village war memorial. Now, this is a war memorial just like in Britain or Australia or New Zealand or anywhere else around the empire. Every village, every town uh, has a, a memorial commemorating those that went to war and didn't come back, and sometimes those that went to the war. So it's a listing of all the people that went to the war. And our village has a, a listing of all of those that died during the First World War, with an addition to the Second World War uh, uh, as well. And it's a, a French uh, soldier with his rifle at the at the port, looking over his shoulder slightly, life size on a on a plinth just beside the church. So I'd recommend anybody to go and stop and just remember the people that left this village to fight. I always think about that and sadly lost their lives. But what was it like for the guys that left the village to fight and came back at the end of the war to nothing? You know, they must have thought, what have we been fighting for? My village is gone. There's nothing left. I think it's extraordinary, Pete, that wherever you go in France, you see these wonderful town memorials, these community memorials to their missing soldiers. And as you say, those of us in Australia or the UK or New Zealand or other parts of the Commonwealth would understand 
what they represent, the, the, the boys that went off from that town and, and never came back. But I agree with you. I always think it's extraordinary when I'm in a village that is on the battlefields. And you imagine the French soldiers from that village, they're not fighting in that area. They're fighting probably 100 kilometers to the south in the French sector. And it must have been extraordinary during the fighting for them to know that their village and their family were caught up in this maelstrom of, the, this, of war and to be thinking about what is going on in their home village. So you, you can be in Provence or Bordeaux or hundreds and hundreds of kilometres away from where the fighting actually was and still see these memorials to French soldiers who were killed. But imagine what it was like for those boys who came from the villages that are now being destroyed in the fighting. Yeah, I think I think it's very moving. The other thing, of course, that you also see on the memorials here in the battle zones uh, are the civilians that died. Uh, so they do actually list any civilians that died during the fighting. Now it's difficult to to unless you have a, a history of the village to know when those civilians died. Whether it's when the Germans first arrived or whether it was in the period when they're still here when we come back. Um, here, because the village was evacuated, I think uh, I'm not even sure we have actually any to be truthful, whether we have any uh, civilians on our village war memorial, but I I think there's one, um, and almost certainly killed when the Germans first arrived. Uh, Some of the elderly uh, and some of the very young didn't feel it was necessary to leave. When I say very young, I I mean young teenagers who who have not been called up uh, and uh, are often left to try and look after the farm, to look after the cows if they're there. And sadly, it's some of those that sadly will will lose their lives. but uh, it's not that many. And I often kind of, it was something I used to say, and I don't say it any longer, that the Germans uh, you know, didn't deliberately kill civilians uh, in, these, in these battles. But of course, they had prior to this, in coming through Belgium, there'd been an awful lot of atrocities taking place. And one of the sadder aspects is the refugees that they rounded up in some of these villages as they evacuated them and fortified these villages, they put them into, into camps and they didn't care for them very well. And there were big typhus epidemics that swept through them uh, in, the, in the period when they were they're held in, within the these camps and so a lot of uh, a lot of deaths so it wasn't quite as pleasant as we as we imagine it's um when i stand in front of these memorials pete i think of the words that one of my historian comrades it might even have been you said to me it's, it was either you or tom morgan i would imagine that another great uh, battlefield historian that i enjoyed walking the battlefields with uh, but uh, summed it up very neatly the the way that we choose to remember as as nationalities the way that we choose to remember the dead of the of the first world war and it's not it's not comprehensive, this assessment, but I think it gives a good overview. And the, the, the feeling is that when you go to a British cemetery and a Commonwealth cemetery, you see that to the British and Commonwealth soldiers, the loss of a soldier was a loss to his family. So his headstone emphasises individuality. There's messages from the family. The loss to a French, to the French, is demonstrated that it was a loss to his community, which is why we often see these these community memorials listing people from the village. And then when we go to the German cemeteries, we see that the loss of a German soldier was a loss to the fatherland. The German cemeteries are very stoic, collective, does not, do not emphasise individuality in any great way and emphasise the collective loss, which obviously reflects the way Germany was feeling at the end of the war when these cemeteries were put together. So I think these, these memorials tell a much bigger story than just merely what they represent in that village or what the names represent in that village. It's interesting, we're not going to walk past it, but the village cemetery, which is uh, behind the main road that we're walking down, uh, Rue Principal is what we're walking down, the main road effectively. Well, the village cemetery actually has another memorial, and it's a duplicate of the memorial within the village beside the church, and uh, it has the names again. And I often wonder, why have they done it twice? Well, I think that's very much part of that story, is they wanted them to be in the village cemetery as well. So their names are within the village cemetery, as well as being visible to everybody they're visible privately to the people that go to the village cemetery so i think it's an interesting concept and i think you're absolutely right it wasn't me by the way it must have been tom that uh, that that said this but he's, he's absolutely absolutely correct well if you're listening tom thank you for um letting me uh, borrow that uh, phrase because it sums it up so neatly and uh, i've used it many times on the battlefields and i think especially when you're standing in a stark german cemetery uh that uh, it, it it helps make a lot of sense but back to fleur Yep. Where are we heading now, Pete? So the church is on the right-hand side. This is a, a rebuilt church. It's uh, it's similar. It's certainly not a, a replica of what was here before. And that's one of the, an interesting concept that the French didn't attempt, as perhaps the best example would be Germany after the Second World War. It rebuilt a lot of its ancient buildings were rebuilt exactly ha- as they had been. But in France, then it, it's 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 similar, but it doesn't there was no it wasn't felt the need to actually reproduce exactly what had been uh, there before. So it. It's a similar size, but different. 
Um, I don't think I can describe it. It's actually quite odd. It's got the signs of the zodiac over the door, which I always feel is quite odd for a church, but that's what it has, the signs of the zodiac over the door. Beside the, the door to the church, on the left-hand side, we have another two new memorials, uh, and they're new that they were built on the uh, the centenary, or, or inaugurated on the centenary of the fighting um, in uh, the September of 1916. And they are commemorating the 17th Battalion of the Middlesex Regiment, which is known as the Footballers Battalion. They have a memorial there. Uh, that was un- unveiled on the 10th of July in uh, 2016. And then we have a New Zealand memorial um, in steel, which is the fern leaf cut into the steel. Um, and that commemorates the New Zealanders fighting here. So uh, those are both new memorials. And it's an interesting concept, I suppose, or an interesting comment, not a concept, an interesting comment that we are still building memorials. You know, 100 years after the fighting, we are still put- putting memorials up on the village. And I suppose what's more, more interesting, or within the villages, is that the villages are allowing it because they don't have to. You know, the mayor can say, no, don't be so stupid, I'm not having a memorial put up here a hundred years after the fighting. But here we have two new memorials put up on the centenaries of the fighting and beside the church and very much looked after by the, the villagers themselves, by the mayor and his committee and always have flowers on them at uh, every commemorative uh, event, the 11th of November being the, uh, the probably the biggest one. And so it's uh, it's part of the village. They are very much aware of what went on in this area and uh, and the need to commemorate it. It's a fascinating concept, Pete, and I don't want to wander off too much on a tangent here, but it is something I'm fairly passionate about. The concept of new memorials. You know, the veterans are all gone. The, the, the memorials that were put up in the immediate post-war years or even several decades later were primarily designed and built for the veterans who had fought there. So they had somewhere to come and remember or so that they would not be forgotten. Now, obviously, those veterans are all gone, but we still have this compelling need to remember and I'm, I'm in two minds about it. I'll be completely honest. I'm in two minds about it. I think, I think some of the new memorials that are going up are absolutely excellent and and fill a, fill a gap for modern visitors. And there are now many more visitors coming to the battlefields than probably in any time in history. And so some of the new memorials do fill gaps and make sure that important parts of the battlefields are not overlooked. But some of them, being totally frank, are absolutely awful and we could list them all. The biggest atrocity, of course, is the one I always mention, is the terrible animal memorial and the memorial park being privately constructed at Pozier and, in my opinion, completely obliterating one of the most important Australian battlefields with absolute tat. And that's actually me being diplomatic. If you've heard me making other comments about it, you'll see what I'm talking about. But go and jump on the web and just have a look at that monstrosity that is blighting the battlefield at Pozier. Again, well-meaning people, but they are completely misguided and they are destroying the battlefield by erecting memorials all over it um and other ones like the the it's interesting you mentioned a football memorial because football for some reason has become indelibly linked with the first world war the stories of the christmas truce and uh, the game of football that may or may not have been played um during the christmas truce in 1914 there is a you know uefa the international soccer federation has now built its own memorial up in belgium which again is pretty awful um more as a marketing attempt for to promote the game of football i believe than any sort of legitimate <laughs> uh effort to remember but you know it's 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 fascinating and i think sometimes not all the time but sometimes new memorials say a lot more about us than they do about the men who actually fought there i think that's that's i've sort of hung you out to dry a bit there pete i've uh, <laughs> pretty controversial what i've said i'll invite you to either be the voice of reason or to uh, to back me up on that one no, I'm backing you up, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, I think it's interesting. I have to say the two memorials that I've just been discussing in the village are discreet and uh, and where they are works very well. If they were elsewhere, I'm not sure that I would be uh, so keen on them. Um, but they, they do the job very well where they are. Uh, but you're absolutely right, there are some absolute horrors. I think we could do a podcast on horrors on the battlefield, recent horrors on the battlefield. Um, not the horrors of the fighting, the horrors of building memorials because there are some absolute shockers. Uh, and it's ongoing and I have to say... You know, that, that is one of the, the, the like, we could do a podcast on about it. How do we feel about uh, about uh, memorials being built? Which leads on nicely to my next uh, subject, which is the 41st Divisional Memorial within the village. So we carry on walking up the main street and we can see it very clearly in front of us. It's, uh, it's the village square, which actually is odd because it's not in the centre of the village. It's more on the far side of the village to where I live. Um, but it's got a beautiful memorial to the 41st Division. The 41st Division was the division that actually took the village on the 4th. Fourteenth um, on the fifteenth, sorry, of September, along with uh, the tanks of D Company um, and uh, the New Zealanders. 
New Zealand Division fighting on the left-hand side and then actually moving into the village itself to support the 41st Division. So the 41st Division decided to build this beautiful depiction of a soldier in fighting order, larger than life, on top of another plinth. It is, in my view, one of the best memorials on the Western Front, uh, only really surpassed by the brand new memorial, and again, a beautiful memorial uh, of a Scottish soldier fighting, uh, this is just outside Ypres, fighting at Black Watch Corner, which is at Polygon Wood, and I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll we've, we think we've already covered it, but if we, uh, if we haven't, we will be covering uh, that, uh, that Scottish soldier and his story. Um, and again, I put a little point on my notes here. How did the French feel about the building of this memorial? And I have to say, it's not common to have a depiction of a British soldier, certainly a fighting British soldier in uh, in all of his uh, paraphernalia. You don't see too many of that type of memorial. Very often the memorials are just obelisks. So I'm not sure whether we were not keen or whether the French, which had their say about what they liked and what they didn't like, whether they were not that keen on depictions of British soldiers. But uh, here, here he, he is in the centre of the village and... He's, um, I've known him all of my life in one way or another because one of the early books that I bought when I very first became interested in the First World War by uh, Rose Coombs, and he's emblazoned on the front of it, and it's still in, in uh, it's still been published, multiple uh, updates. Um, most, most, so the most recent, in fact, has a, a photograph that I took, a colour photograph on the front uh, of the memorial. Uh, so it's uh, it's he is an image that I think uh, is a, a very very. Uh, successful imagery of, of this or successful that's not a very good word it's an image that i i like and i think would one that uh, a lot of people who are interested in the first world war would recognize it's well said Peyton. before we move on from the subject of memorials i i should uh, just clarify my earlier comments as well to just say that many of the memorials are very thoughtful and well placed and, and 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 contribute a lot to the to the battlefields and particularly the new zealand memorials because for some inexplicable reason new zealand was poorly represented the it's i think it's the kiwis the way they like to do things is they're always understated and even their memorials you know were 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 quite understated on the western front so i think it's great some of the new new zealand memorials that are popping up other ones not so sure about but um the, you're right the 41st division memorial is uh, absolutely spectacular uh, just an interesting comment here because of the New Zealanders fighting here. They did have a cross. We're going to walk towards it and it's really almost where our, our walk will finish. A little place called Factory Corner. And that's where they originally placed a memorial cross there. Now that memorial cross slowly deteriorated and by the mid-twenties it was decided it wasn't really suitable and they decided uh, as well the New Zealand government decided to place their, their permanent memorial elsewhere. It's, in fact it's on the ridge just uh, uh, behind me um, where we are now standing in the middle of, middle of the village looking if we were to look behind where we've just come from, the ridge behind us, that's where the New Zealand Memorial is. A, a little little known fact is that the uh, the cross that was there was actually burnt and they decided to destroy it and they burnt it. But they gathered up the ashes from the cross and they scattered them on the graves of New Zealand soldiers who had died fighting in the in the area. And that's very moving that they thought it through. And that was actually the Imperial War Graves that thought it through. That, that was the right thing to do with this cross as they destroyed a memorial that was no longer uh, required. OK, so we're going to uh, now turn right at this memorial, at the 41st Divisional Memorial. We're going to do a little detour instead of walking straight out through the village. And we're going to head to a little cemetery. And I have to say I'm biased because it's within our village or my village. And um, it's Bulls Road Cemetery. Beautiful little cemetery, one of the smaller cemeteries on the Western Front, tucked into a bank, which is exactly why it's there, because it is a battlefield cemetery. There was a casualty clearing station there, um, and so the people were being buried there on their evacuation route. And then it's going to be used as a concentration cemetery. So it's, it's a, a lovely cemetery, cross of sacrifice, uh, standing out. I photograph it an awful, awful lot, go there in all sorts of different weather to get a good view uh, of it. There's almost two phases to it. Uh, one of them is the uh, an upper area, which is almost exclusively Australian. And those are the Australians that were holding the line here uh, at the period uh, uh, of the winter of 1916-17. So it's actually from the October onwards, October to the Germans' withdraw to the Hindenburg Line in the March uh, of 1917. And they were burying their dead uh, who were uh, dying in this area there, on this raised area. And then after the Germans withdrew to the Hindenburg line, it's the first time we have an attempt to clear the battlefield. And so we have the lower section, our soldiers who were recovered and then moved into a, a concentration cemetery. And that concentration will continue on till after the war as well. 
Um, the cemetery itself was designed by uh, Sir Herbert Baker, and he's the guy that will design Tynecott, the largest Commonwealth War Grave cemetery in the world. So he's one of the the greater uh, uh, the greater designers of the uh, the cemeteries of the First World War. So, Pete, tell us some of the stories of the men who are buried in this cemetery. Well, I think to me, uh, I like uh, looking at the average man, the uh, Joe Bloggs who's buried in the cemetery. There's obviously the great and good in most of these cemeteries. Um, But it's uh, it's really a personal story, and it's about one of my, I think, probably the second visit to Australia. And we went to an area known as Kangaroo Valley, quite close to where my brother lives. And there's a little uh, museum there we we went in, and uh, straight away we we saw this this inscription to a chap called George Ditton. And George Ditton is uh, is buried here in the little in the cemetery here, and uh, just reading his story and knowing more about him brings him him home. And he's a very small chap. He was rejected twice when he tried to enlist because he was five foot two. And he must have walked around the block and managed to stand on his tippy toes because he eventually got accepted and uh, and joined up. Uh, and uh, he uh, uh, joined the his battalion on the 18th of, of January. And sadly, on the 20th of January, he was actually killed. So he survived for, for two days in the front line. That's all. All of that expectation, all of that effort to get in. Uh, 45th Battalion was the battalion that he served with. And sadly, he's there for two days. Most of the chaps that were with him wouldn't have even known his name. It's just so moving to go and sit beside him. And uh, 24 years old, two days service on the front line. Absolutely extraordinary. It's those stories that just just grab you, don't they? <laughs> this is why we're we're interested in this history. People often ask me why I'm so intrigued with these stories of war, and to me, it's the the personal stories. It's not it's not about generals and and tactics and and strategy, although that is an important part of it. But it's those personal stories that just grip you and and, and just fascinate you every time. And there's so many of them. And we could study this for a century, another century on from now. And we will never learn all of these individual stories. They're, they're just absolutely extraordinary. That's a great one that I hadn't heard before. Just, just very, very moving. I think what's interesting is uh, in the the particular time that we're living in at the moment, uh, I'm restricted uh, now to where I can go, and I can only actually walk uh, one kilometre in any direction from uh, where I live, and so I can only hit two cemeteries. I can only get to two cemeteries. So interestingly, it's made me look more carefully at the cemetery at Bulls Road, and I've actually started looking at the individual stories of those that are buried within the cemetery, and it's just fascinating. They've all got stories. There's a story connected to, to every one. I mean, you could write half a dozen books just about the men in this in this one cemetery. So I suppose what I better do is give you the numbers of how many people there are buried in the cemetery here at Bulls Road. So we have uh, 776 uh, burials or commemorations of men who may not be in the cemetery, but they're commemorated there. Um, of which 296 are unknown. And and that's mainly because of this uh, concentration effort to bring bodies in later on into the cemetery. And very often we don't know who these uh, who these guys are, are that are, are actually brought in. That's a relatively high proportion of known burials, isn't it? And I think that reflects probably the fact that it was a casualty clearing station and therefore the men that came in were fairly well documented when they arrived, as opposed to some of these battlefield cemeteries right in the front line where... Uh, where the, the, they weren't keeping as good a track of the bodies that they were bringing in, or indeed the concentration cemeteries where they were clearing the battlefields years after the war. Yeah, that, that, that's correct. And in fact, of the Australians that are commemorated here, the, the 155 Australians, the majority of them are actually known, uh, and that is because they died and were buried at the time and not gathered in later on. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a one of those typical cemeteries of the Western Front, a mix of battlefield burials and uh, concentration and guys that uh, were, were died on the evacuation route. The interesting thing for our Australian listeners is that the majority of the Australians in these cemeteries were killed during the winter, as we've mentioned, of 1617. And there, there was a couple of actions that occurred here, which are, you know, I think rather grandly known as the Battle of Fleur. Uh, which are remembered very strongly in Australia, as distinctly from the fighting that occurred earlier here in the Somme fighting. Um, but we uh, we should cover that, Pete, in a, in a future podcast. It would be great to walk that ground around these these trenches and the maze and Guadalcore and, the, and some of these places where it wasn't. There weren't huge actions, but they were also the scene of some of the greatest misery for Australian soldiers during that during the First World War, just because of the the conditions during that awful winter of nineteen sixteen seventeen. 
I think it's interesting, and no doubt I'll, I'll talk about it when we do actually do a podcast covering that area. But it's well worth thinking about that it was it was remembered fairly well in, in Australia because uh, the dioramas in the War Memorial, one of them depicts that winter. It's not depicting a particular an attack; it is just depicting men suffering in terrible uh, weather and winter conditions in trenches when they haven't actually got the uh, the correct amount of clothing, and there was a shortage of almost everything. So it's uh, it was something that uh, deserves to be remembered, and certainly. I'd look forward to doing a podcast covering the uh, the attacks that took place at that period, one of the most famous being on the 5th of November, uh, 1916, right at the end of the Battle of the Somme. And Pete, something you've mentioned to me before, which I think would be great to discuss with, uh, with anyone listening here, is the Long Tunnel, because this is connected with Bulls Road Cemetery. Just talk to me about this. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating aspect, mainly because it's still not known exactly what, what it is. Uh, there's a very famous book uh, by a chap called uh, Trevor Pidgeon, who wrote about the tanks fighting here. And he heard the rumours that there was a very long tunnel, uh, the entrance of which was supposed to be somewhere close to the cemetery, which um, ran along that bank that we'd been, uh, as we walked into the village, the bank on the right-hand side, and was ridiculously about a kilometre long. And he kind of poo poos it. He thinks, no, nah, I'm not sure it, it, it actually, I can't find any proof of it. I don't think he would then, at that period when he was writing his book, have access, as we do nowadays, to, to be able to look online at uh, battalion uh, diaries, Australian battalion diaries, because over and over in those diaries for the units that were there, there is comments about the long tunnel, the chalk tunnel, uh, the, uh, the accommodation in the chalk tunnel. Uh, and it's always Bulls Road uh, and the where the cemetery now is that they are discussing. So I, I'm fairly certain that there was a tunnel there. In fact, I'm not fairly certain. There definitely was a tunnel there. How big it was, how long it was. But certainly I found accounts of almost whole battalions being within, and that's a thousand men, being w- the, within these uh, these tunnel complexes or this long tunnel. So I think it's fascinating. And I'd love to go and find the entrance and have a rummage in there. But uh, we don't know exactly where it was. I'll just tell you a final little story because it is so fascinating. Google Earth, when it first came out, a lot of us were really pleased, uh, the people that walk and look at the battlefields, because here we have an opportunity to look down on the landscape from above. Well, roughly where the tunnel is supposed to be, you can see these little white dots going right the way along where it should be. And there's obviously something growing in the crops or something changing the crops where where these white dots are. And I think it's breather holes. I think it's breather holes for the tunnel. Um, I'm only guessing. Uh, I've looked recently and uh, you can't see them now because they're using a different picture. I believe you can go back in history and look at earlier pictures of uh, of Google Earth. But I think it's it's fascinating that it may exist. It, uh, it, may, be, it may be there. Well, that'll be a great discovery for the future if you uncover that, Pete. So that will imagine that podcast after after that discovery. <laughs> Where are we heading next on the walk? Okay, so um, the view that we get from, uh, that's one of the great things about Bulls Road Cemetery, it's slightly elevated, so you can actually look towards the front line, and from uh, Bulls Road Cemetery, we can see right the way up a, a little track, and it's the track we're going to walk, and it's called Grass Lane. Uh, my northern accent uh, makes that little, I'm going to try it again, Grass Lane. So we're walking up Grass Lane. Uh, that leads us to the front line. So we're fairly close to the front line of that winter of 1617, perhaps a kilometre or less away, uh, 800 metres maybe to the uh, the front line so we're going to walk towards it along this uh, this uh, this grass lane and all the time we're walking along it in front of us we can see yet another cemetery and this is the second cemetery that I can just about reach in my kilometre walk um, and uh, this cemetery is uh, called the AIF cemetery um, grass lane so it's a very unusual cemetery in it's the only one on the whole of the western front that uses the name uh, AIF, Australian Imperial Forces, uh, and I think its f- proper title is the Australian Imperial Forces Burial Ground Flares. That is its actual proper title, but most people just know it as the AIF uh, Cemetery. So immediately you think, well, this must have been a cemetery that is uh, just full of Australians. Well, actually it's not, because it is in the main, an enormous concentration cemetery. And it's one of the biggest ones in the area here. And they are concentrating men from right across the battlefield, all the way to Beaumont Hamill on the other side of the battlefield. We have soldiers buried within this cemetery. Another beautiful cemetery, also designed by Sir Herbert Baker. Um, and I like his designs. I think he's a very good designer of cemeteries. I like his rubble walls that he builds and the, the coping stones of, uh, of uh, Jurassic limestone on the top. Uh, it's a beautiful Beautiful, beautiful cemetery. And how many people are buried here, Pete? Because it's, it's, you know, the number of times I've been to this cemetery and just overwhelmed almost by the, the sheer number of burials in this spot. 
Well, this is this is a whopper. So three thousand uh, four hundred and seventy five uh, men are buried or commemorated within the cemetery. But the shocking thing is two thousand two hundred and sixty three of those men. We don't know who they are. We also have 170 French soldiers. So again, we get this French connection who are buried within the cemetery and three Germans. We actually have three Germans uh, here uh, as well. Now, interestingly, if you read in the splurb uh, in the cemetery booklet, it, it says started by Australian medical units, Australian be- medical units uh, based nearby in November of 1916. I'm just, I just don't believe that. I think it's extraordinary if, if that's true because it is almost right in the front line and it's very, very visible from the German front line positions. I think there's a bit of a confusion between Bulls Road and this cemetery. Uh, if there were burials here, they would be tucked into the bank because again, there was a little quarry here, tucked into the bank and it wouldn't be many. It would just be so difficult to bury people here so close to the front line. And in fact, walking up and down the cemetery I can find no grouping that looks like it's an original battlefield cemetery uh, uh, where you'd get scattered graves not nice neat lines there's none of that so I, I'm not sure but that certainly is what is in the booklet it says that it, uh, it was begun in the November of 1916. We did a, a fascinating podcast a year or so ago Pete on my Living History uh, podcast channel uh, about the cemeteries of the Western Front and I'd suggest that uh, people go and listen to that um, because it tells just an amazing story about the creation of these cemeteries in the post-war years, the different types of cemeteries, the way that when you visit a cemetery, you can tell the story of what went on around there just by the layouts of the graves or the or, or, or noting the dates on the headstones. So if you haven't listened to that, go and check out that uh, that podcast on my Living History channel, uh, because you'll hear Pete Smith and me talking all about those uh, those fascinating stories that these cemeteries can tell. It's one of my favourite, uh, I suppose, favourite subjects are the creation of the cemeteries, the movement of the dead, uh, the uh, trying to identify them. It's it's really fascinating, and and certainly there's a lot more work needs doing. And uh, thankfully, we have uh, a lot of historians who are who are writing books of, uh, about this period and what went on. I think one of the most recent ones that I've enjoyed reading, and I can't remember the author, and you'll have to forgive me, but it's about the photographic teams who are also going around taking photographs of the graves uh, as they were were originally being created with their wooden crosses and I think that's another fascinating story it certainly is it's one of the aspects of the battlefields that's most important I would say because when we visit the battlefields we are looking for tangible connections with the history and there's nothing more tangible than seeing the graves of the men who were killed in fighting in that area and they will remain there it doesn't matter long after the trenches are gone and long after the every trace of the war has disappeared from the landscape those men will still be there uh, as, as a testament to what went on so the cemeteries are a vitally important aspect of, of commemorating this history on the battlefields and something that I recommend everyone should spend as much time in as they can when they walk the ground. Uh, I think you're right. And it's, it's interesting. I do occasionally, when I'm guiding uh, uh, clients around the battlefield, I do get comments from people saying, oh, not another cemetery. And I normally take them aside and say, it's not just about the cemetery, it's about learning the stories of the people that are buried within the cemetery. But there's nothing, I suppose, more important than actually going to where these, these guys that fought and died for us are, are buried. And yes, in this walk, we're covering the two facets, the memorials, the landscape, and uh, and the cemeteries. But the cemeteries are an integral part of the battlefields and I think it's absolutely crucial that you go to as, as many as you can and uh, don't be bored by them because there are stories within them it's learning the stories very well said and AIF burial ground is uh, is, is an absolute highlight especially if you're an Australian uh, or indeed a British listener there are some wonderful stories in that cemetery where to next Pete so that really brings the walk uh, to its end now. We can look back from uh, this point, from the AIF burial ground. We can look back to the village. You can see the church standing out and the trees within the village. Um, and I just wanted to talk finally really about the, the rebuilding of the village and, and what was that process that, that took place? How did that come about? Well, the village had gone. There was nothing here. So you have to imagine, first of all, you need surveyors to figure out where everything everything was. One of the things they did was to clear the rubble and what was left. And in fact, it, it was quite, quite handy in a way, I suppose. There are trenches and shell holes and, and the, gra- the ground ripples. So effectively, they took the rubble, that that remained from the village, and they scraped it into the shell holes and the trenches, hence levelling the ground ready for reconstruction. They then rebuilt the houses, and this will take uh, to 1927, the date of my house. Around about that time is when we get up to uh, the, the roofs are going on and people are coming back. In fact, people were back well before that because the what they're living in are the wooden 
shacks and huts that were used by the troops. They were dismantled from the rear areas and brought into these uh, these red zone, the zone reds, the uh, destroyed areas, and used for accommodation for the people as they're rebuilding. Then they had temporary huts that were a bit more substantial built, and eventually we get the, the houses. And in fact, on my property, I used to have, sadly, it, it, one part has gone, but I used to have all three phases. The wooden hut was here. Sadly, it was in next door's garden, and he demolished it while we were moving in, which was a shame. Um, and then we had the, uh, the the earlier house, a very small house that was uh, that was built. And the farmer himself told me that he came back, um, uh, but his wife didn't come back until the big house was built. So he came back with his son, and they carried on clearing the battlefields because, of course, they have to get the uh, the, the fields under the plough again. And then when the big house was built, then his uh, his wife came uh, came back here. So where was this being financed from? Well, it's been financed by the French, as you'd expect. But there was an attempt in the very early uh, years after the war, before the big depression, uh, of twinning with uh, British cities. So this village is actually twinned with Portsmouth, with, which may seem unusual. Anybody that knows England, you know, Portsmouth is an enormous great seaport. So what on earth uh, is the connection between the small village of Flair and uh, the uh, the big uh, seaport, the big city of Portsmouth in Britain? And it's because their volunteer battalion, their PALS battalion of the Hampshire Regiment, the, the Portsmouth, second Portsmouth uh, PALS basically fought here. They fought in the village uh, on that 15th of September uh, fighting when the village was retaken. So that's that's where the twinning came from and the whole idea was that we would actually help pay for the rebuilding of these villages. Sadly the depression came along and the whole concept slowly collapsed uh, but yet it's still remembered that in the within the uh, the village hall here the, uh, the the Marie in fact the where the mayor hangs out um, there is a, an inscription that commemorates the fact that it uh, that we are twinned with Portsmouth uh, in Britain. Well Pete it's been an absolutely wonderful journey through your hometown in France so thank you very much for uh for sharing it with us, as I said at the start of this interview, I, I'm I'm really looking forward to exploring these these less well known chapters of the First World War, and particularly these places where so much amazing history unfolded, yet most people don't know much about it. So, just thank you so much for for sharing with this this uh, amazing story with us, and for for walking through the village with me today. It's been very enjoyable, and it's nice to uh, to talk about uh, the village where I I live. Mm-hmm. 